can't tell you how good it is to see everyone here. 11 years ago, starting the Institute for Economics and Peace, it's, I can't tell you how much pleasure it is to just watch the momentum all the work's got as it's moved on. Can you hear me at the back okay? Great. And also, there's some great friends here, I must admit, guys like Chick Dumbuck, who's uh, been with us uh, all the way, right from the very, very, very beginning. So for me, in some ways, it, uh, for a number of you, it's like coming home to friends. Now, what I'm going to do is I'll just cover a little bit, I think, on my view, and there are a couple of different views, of the history of positive peace, then I'll come back into the Institute, where it is today and what we're actually working with it. So I'll probably talk for about 15 minutes, because I'm aware of the time constraints, because Michelle's put together a very, very full and very quick agenda. So, for me... The history of positive peace really started with Tolstoy back in the 19th century. And he was probably one of the greatest scholars on the uh, war and peace of his age, and still a lot of his works resonate today. And he came, after many, many years, he came to the concept that we'd been for thousands of years trying to create peace by finding what was evil and destroying it. But in the very process of doing that, we come, become what we're trying to kill. And he coined a book called The uh, Kingdom of God is Within. And to search for peace, one had to look within inside oneself. Now, he spent a lot of time corresponding with Gandhi. And a lot of the concepts Gandhi built, he built up from that. And for Gandhi, he took it and he moved the concepts into concepts now which you could apply to society, which were non-violent, they were also spiritually based, but more important, they encapsulated social justice. And those ideas then sort of moved on to Martin Luther King. And we're all sort of familiar with his famous uh, letter from Birmingham jail, where he spoke about peace not being the absence of physical force, but an environment in which social justice thrived. There's one quote which always stands out from Martin Luther King because for me, in many ways, it's, how can I put it, how can I put it, it's practical, it's uh, grounded, and I guess that's what his life in many ways was, was about. So non-violence means not only avoiding external physical violence, but violence of the spirit as well. You not only refuse to shoot the man, you refuse to hate him as well. So positive peace really about creating an environment where that can come about. And so as we move further on, Johann Gulten in the 60s and 70s then started to coin the concept of positive peace. Martin Luther King termed the concept of negative peace. And that's the, just the absence of violence but in an oppressive state. And so as Johann Gulten moved on, his work was very, very much morally based. And out of that came concepts and the framework of what we could call positive peace. But during the 90s and the 2000s, that started to now not really get out of the peace and conflict centres. And I think at that point, we came along with the Institute for Economics and Peace. And the starting point for us to get to positive peace was accidental in many, many ways. We started with the concept of the Global Peace Index, which was aimed at measuring just the peacefulness of societies. And that came to me simply while I was walking through northeast Kivu in the Congo and started to think, what are the most peaceful nations in the world? Searched the internet and couldn't find anything. But I think the profound insight out of that is if we haven't actually measured peace, can we truly understand it? And can we truly know whether our actions are helping or hindering us in what we would do? The next stage, once we actually had an authoritative index which measured the nations of the world by their peacefulness, was to actually now start to see what actually were the things which were statistically significantly associated with it. And that body of work came to be known as what we would term positive peace. But it's literally the only body of work in the world which takes an empiric approach to actually deriving what actually creates positive peace. All those attitudes, institutions and structures which create peaceful societies. But what we did then, and so we've got it, now 
The next thing to do was to really understand, did that actually work in reality? And to do that, we took positive peace and now did a whole lot of statistical analysis to see what other things positive peace was associated with. And so we got into that, and David Hammond will be talking about it in more detail soon, came out to be quite profound. So societies which are strong in positive peace tend to have higher GDP growth rates. In fact, countries which are improving in positive peace compared to countries which are falling in positive peace over a 17-year period had on average 2% per annum higher GDP growth rates. And that, from economic performance, is phenomenal. Societies which are high in positive peace don't have genocides. They don't have violent revolutions. They have very rarely have political shocks. We also find that societies which are high in positive peace are better on measures of social cohesion, better on the acceptance of other people's rights, gender equality, perform better on environmental measures, and much, much more. They recover better from a, uh, external shocks like earthquakes they also, or hurricanes. They also, in many ways, form the basis of societies which are highly resilient. So... So we started to move further on then, we started to now see that positive peace didn't actually sit on its own, it was actually part of a system. And so from there we started to move in and look at systems thinking, and we won't be covering much of it today, but as a concept this is actually profound, actually really quite profound. So all of us here, when we sit down and we look at the way we manage societies, think it from a cause and effect. Here's a problem, what is the cause? Fix the cause. And that comes out of the whole history of modern scientific thought, which is to take things because out of the physical world. And built into us, we understand this deeply, right in our subconscious, because that's how we walk. That's how we catch a ball. But societies don't work like that. They don't work the same. So in the physical world, the cause creates the effect, but the effect has no influence on the cause. But we as human beings operate very, very differently. We work in what's termed mutual feedback loops. So as I'm talking to everyone here, I'm actually changing your consciousness. And me, how long I'm actually going to talk for and what I'm going to say is influenced by the amount of attention I've got from you coming back to me. Think of two political parties forever changing their posture towards each other. So societies operate in a whole different set of premises than what causality does. And that, my friends, is really profound. But today's not something to go into it in more detail. But one of the things you do get from systems thinking is if we start to now look at the nation state as a system, it now lies within bigger systems. It also has smaller systems associated within it. Within it could be the education, could be the criminal justice. They're smaller systems. But by understanding the nation state as a system, we can now fit it back in to those bigger ecological systems, which we now all know which we're dependent on. And that probably brings us to what is the major challenge of our age. If we look at the world today, our challenges are global in nature, things like climate change, ever-decreasing biodiversity, full use of the fresh water on the planet. Underpinning all them is actually overpopulation. But unless we can have a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of trust, cooperation or inclusiveness which are necessary to solve these problems. Therefore, peace in many ways is prerequisite for the survival of society as we know it in the 21st century. And that is different than any other epoch in human history. And that is the basis of why positive peace is transformational. It gives us a different way of being able to view societies and the way societies operate. So as we look at the work we're doing at the Institute now, I can remember with Chick, actually, we eight years ago, wandering around Capitol Hill, and trying to talk about peace. And everyone was saying, you can't use the word peace. It's just totally socially unacceptable. Use the word security. And Chick and myself would keep pushing back and would say, no, we will. We're just going to keep going with peace. And you should use the words positive peace. And you'd see it even inside our own community. You get these blank 
stairs. But today, uh, it's a, quite amazing. It's changed, really changed. So the Institute of Economics and Peace has now we've got a whole series of programs going globally which are working on this, and I'll just move through a few of them. So we started off running a number of positive peace workshops. And something really quite profound came out of that, which was really simple. And it comes back to the concept of cause and effect. Got a problem, find the cause. Try and fix the cause. But generally, when you do that, you'll find that there are human beings associated with it. And so now you're off into another fight, because no one really wants to be the problem, do they? So, but with taking a systems process and using positive peace, what you've got is the ability now to not worry about each of individual events, which is cause and effect. You're more interested in the relationships and flows, so you've got a system running in the right direction. So when you're working with positive peace, you're looking forward. What are the ch changes we can make in the system so the system actually self-rectifies around the events? And so we run workshops in the, uh, places like Zimbabwe. We've done them in Libya. We've done them in Mexico and other places as well, uh, Uganda, for example. But I'll just hit the one in Zimbabwe just very, very quickly. So workshop we did in Zimbabwe, so it was a 15-month exercise working out what would be something you could do for each of the pillars of positive peace. And it pulled across the political divide there, and that political divide is larger than what you've actually got in the US today. And so what happened at the end of the conference, we had the vice president, Mnangagwa, open the conference. He'll probably take over from Mugabe. He'll probably be the next president there. And he's the head of the defence forces. So in the room, we had the government, the opposition, civil society aligned with the government, all the other forms of civil society. And literally, this was literally true, it was the first time since independence that they're in the same room sitting together and agreeing on something. And that was simply because the idea was to look forward, not look back. If we look at positive peace today, the good news is two-thirds of the world is actually improving. So two out of every three countries in the world over the last 15 years have improved their positive peace. But if we look in the US, we've got a new report on positive peace, which I think is here today, and so it's slightly changed, but in last year, the US had the fourth largest drop globally in positive peace. And so this is back to events, relationships and flows. President Trump is an event. And that event comes out of the interrelationships and flows of the system. So, and you can see that reflected in positive peace with the US having the fourth largest drop globally. Now, if we went to Europe, even though two-thirds of the countries in Europe have improved, what we find is with, sorry, two-thirds of the countries in the world have improved, what we find is in Europe, 50% of the countries have actually decreased. And for similar reasons to the US, we find that the free flow of information, which I know we've got a panel on today, which is exceptionally important, is fallen. And that's mainly because of restrictions around the press, we can also find the perception of corruption has increased as well. That's mainly the relationship of business. And we can find that the equitable distribution of resources has also deteriorated as well. And that's, the, if you like, the difference in wealth between the rich and poor. And what that's led to is that now a decay in the acceptance of rights of others, which we can see in the response to immigration and to refugees. So as we look at it, we can actually see and use positive peace as a mechanism to be able to track the progression of society. So we move forward now, we've got a number of initiatives going. These workshops, like the one which I mentioned in Zimbabwe, we'll be doing many more. I'll be in Myanmar in uh, December, where we're looking at kicking off a whole series of ones through there. We've got a relationship with Rotary, and I believe Steve Brown's here somewhere. He'll be speaking about it later on. Rotary is one of the, uh, uh, the largest uh, 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 service society in the world. Uh, uh, and they've got 1.2 million members, 32,000 branches around the world. And so we're working with a strategic relationship with them so that we'll be taking positive peace and trying to push it out through all those Rotary clubs around the world. 
Uh, we're also in the process, and we've just, just about finished the courses, where we're aiming at training a million people on positive peace. And that'll be through online courses, which we're going to be running. We've even had different states, like I was up in uh, Canada just recently in Winnipeg. In the state of Manitoba, I met with the head of the education department there who wants to take positive peace, put it into the primary school curriculum. So each of the schools within the state, the kids, look at what could they do to improve the positive peace in their school or the positive peace in their community. So these are just some of the things which are coming out of it. So we move forward into the future IEPs gaining traction and momentum all the time. Our research team's growing. And it's really interesting just sitting down and listening to uh, Michelle rattle off all the various offices around the world. And I couldn't help, as she was saying that, thinking a decade ago, there were about four of us sitting in Sydney, and that was about it. So we'll continually improve. One of the mechanisms which we've got, which really sort of springs out of, I guess, the way you develop computer software is concepts of incremental releases and continual improvement. And that's what we'll do with Positive Peace, Global Peace Index, and our other products as well as we move forward. So on that note, I'm going to stop. And look, I just want to thank everyone for coming. It's, yeah, can't tell you how fulfilling it is to see you all here. And I think it's just going to be a great day. Thank you.